Hi, Diana. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Shireen. Thank you for having me. So glad to have you here. I'm really grateful to connect with you. And I would like to ask first if you have a daily practice or ritual or routine that you want to share that you feel is very important to you. Yeah, um, so I have a few, but the one that I'm probably the most consistent with is getting in the water. Um, so I love swimming and just being in the water. It's like very Zen and meditative and also very joyous for me. Um, and so I swim laps, but I also do some kind of water walking and dancing um, and and yeah, just enjoy my time in the water. I think it has a lot to teach me about flow and kind of um, trusting life and releasing control of it and kind of letting letting things carry me. So um, mm -hmm. that's my most consistent thing. And then I also have been really enjoying some singing and dancing and chanting and working with music more. I feel like it's always been a part of my life, but recently I've been really embracing it more as a meditative practice. And so, um, so yeah, those are kind of my main two things that I do pretty regularly and, and just bring me the most joy and presence. Mm, thank you for sharing that. That's like being in water was the first time I've heard uh, from a guest. And I really like that because water, it's like working with the element. Sometimes we're thinking about taking a walk and we can be around trees. So we're working with the tree element in Chinese medicine perspective. And, and the water is so, it's so soothing and cleansing. I love, yeah, what you shared because I feel the same, even just having a shower because the water touches every part of our skin and all of our like the receptive sensors in our body feels it so it's yeah. act very activating and healing I feel like sometimes if it's if if I want to wake up that's a great way to do it and also if I want if I feel tired during the day just feeling the water being in the water rich in a ritual I think that's mm -hmm. beautiful it's like how we do conscious breathing but also like conscious taking in the water how we drink it everything around water that's so beautiful yeah, yeah. and another thing and this is kind of random but that I, I really love about being in the water is when I'm outside and um, I swim in a pool a fair amount because natural bodies of water are um, actually pretty abundant but a bit cold by me <laughs> and so I will get in the rivers and the oceans but um, with pools there's often this effect um, you know, where the, the sun or the light kind of moves through the water and is fragmented into these little kind of rainbows along the bottom of the, the pool. Um, and so there's this really beautiful kind of um, experience of being in the sun and the water and having these rainbows kind of cast about the bottom of the pool, especially in the morning light. And um, yeah, it just something about that whole experience is just kind of pure magic for me <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah that's so beautiful what a beautiful yeah. ritual and I'm so happy that you're here Diana I, I would you. love for you to introduce yourself we're gonna talk about a very fun topic that we both love it's astrology and I, yeah you can introduce yourself first so we can get into all of the astrology parts as well sure yeah so um I'm an evolutionary astrologer, which really just means my focus with astrology is to um, kind of understand where we're coming from in past lifetimes, kind of our karmic conditioning and patterns, along with looking at kind of the, the history or the background or the karmic imprints um, that we experience on a collective level, looking at mythology and its evolution over time, um, and, and just how, you know, experiences of past oppression, repression, pain, wounding, et cetera, kind of have an impact on us today. Um, and then I also do a lot of work with helping people understand kind of the growth opportunities. So looking at where we're coming from and how we can continue to grow and evolve going forward. 
Um, I also am a spiritual coach, and so I'll often leverage astrology in my coaching practice, um, but I'll, I'll also bring in meditation um, and, you know, different exercises, visualizations, inquiry in order to help people who are working toward kind of longer term goals um, or at, at major transitions or kind of pivotal points in their lives. Um, and, and are looking for some clarity, some guidance, and some help taking action and moving forward. Um, so that's kind of the basics of, of what I do. Um, I'm happy to offer a background, but we can also um, kind of just move forward and dive into the astrology, whatever feels right to you. Mm, thank you so much. I, I'm always like, it, when I meet astrologers or those that are studying astrology, it feels like there has been yeah different ways to get into astrology and why and for me personally it really evolved naturally it wasn't something that was done by anyone around me or I had like a major influence but like just having that introduction I think I had an int introduction to it very very early just like a fun thing and then I feel like I got stuck just loving it when I like about 10 11 years ago when I was in my early 20s and I felt like that was so it was like remembering I don't know how did you get into your astrology path um for me it was very accidental <laughs> so I actually really enjoyed story and mythology and actually spirituality when I was a child but that wasn't necessarily, um, you know, part of my familial or cultural or communal experience. So I feel like I kind of lost those parts of myself, even though there was kind of a natural interest or inclination there. Um, and moved on to a very practical path at a certain point, um, thinking that I needed to focus on more kind of tangible ways of, of having an influence or changing the world. And so, um, so most of my career was actually in business and um, more on kind of the tangible health and wellness side. Um, and then I thought that I wanted to work in agriculture and kind of change and evolve food systems. And so I went to work for this large um, grocery chain called Whole Foods Market in the United States and um, was on a small kind of intrapreneurial team for them, um, working on some new initiatives. And while I was there, this woman just kind of by chance asked me what my sun sign was. And I told her that I'm a Virgo, but that I didn't really believe in astrology. And um, she asked me what my moon sign was after that. She kind of just you know, brushed over my whole like skepticism around astrology. And I had no idea what a moon sign was. And so she showed me how to look up my chart. And um, I don't even know if to this day she knows how much she kind of changed the course of my life. Um, but from there, I just, it became an obsession. Um, I, I just... I realized how deep you can dive into it, how accurate it was for me personally, for understanding myself. Um, and, you know, everything just kind of fell into place and made so much sense once I had astrology as a tool. Um, and from there, you know, there's all of these different branches of astrology, so many directions you can take it. And so um, I just kind of read all of the books that I could find and found ultimately that, you know, Stephen Forrest's um, particular branch of um, evolutionary astrology was really kind of the one for me. Um, and from there, I've kind of taken it and evolved it in my own way. I bring in a lot of asteroids. I love working with the goddesses. Um, and so kind of long story short, I think I was kind of born to do this work and knew it at a young age and then completely lost that. Um, and, you know, there were a series of life events that kept bringing me back to kind of the calling to help and heal others. There were, um, have been quite a few um, very close struggles with mental illness around me, um, including some, some folks who have um, chosen to leave this planet and, um, and so I think that those events were also big 
moments of kind of wake up calls and reckonings that once again just made me want to help and heal others and um and kind of move into this this line of work that's beautiful so it was coincidence but still like a destiny for you to get into it and i really like that you said that because um the the I feel like astrology is so interesting because it's about like the journey into yourself and getting mm -hmm. to know yourself. So even if you choose to study astrology just to learn it for yourself, it still like opens up so much. It's kind of like psychology and you get mm -hmm. to like really see things. And the things I read 10 years ago in my chart, now some of them I understand better now because it's it's like over time so you don't you can study it your own chart your whole life and and see how it unfolds and how you can like work with it and evolve with it so yeah. i think that's very beautiful so as in astrology we can look at individuals and groups and of course like the whole collective and i think it's uh before we started recording i mentioned that I feel like it's a lot of integration right now of like we had this opportunity this year to really grow and to like discover ourselves and the world in a completely new way because we had like these big changes happen that we that have been necessary for our own like we we when we come down into non-duality like nothing is good or bad it just is so we have to have like all types of experiences to grow and mm -hmm. we choose the time we come into uh, i really believe that and i'm really curious how you as an astrologer that works also uh, like on all these different layers how you see because now we're coming into the end of the year and we have like I feel like the end of the year is always like very intense things happening for me personally <laughs> I think it's also like a collective thing because we are in the northern hemisphere going into mm -hmm. more the darker parts of the year and I would love yeah. to hear your insights of the upcoming time from an astrological perspective yeah um so the end of this year is definitely a time, like you mentioned, of integration and also transition. Um, and so really the rest of this year in 2022 um, is kind of carrying this big energy of preparing us for something drastically different actually in 2023. Um, so kind of looking at some of what's coming up just a little bit further out. In 2023, Pluto, which is the, the planet of death and rebirth and transformation, Pluto was the Roman god of the underworld, um, will be changing signs from Capricorn to Aquarius. Um, and so going from this very you know, grounded earth sign into this air sign where there's kind of this, this more limitless quality. And then Sedna, which is the, so Pluto was our, our previous kind of outer limit of our solar system. That was the furthest out planet or dwarf planet as far as we knew. And then we discovered Sedna and Sedna is this Inuit goddess of the sea. Um, and she tends to represent kind of these major consciousness shifts that occur after we stop clinging to an old way of life. And so Sedna has been um, in Taurus, so another earth sign for or, um, you know, since 1965, so for many decades now, and she is about to move into an air sign into Gemini. Um, Pluto has been in Capricorn since 2008. So again, these are slow moving planets, they're further out, their orbits take longer around the sun. Um, and so we have this big shift happening again in 2023 from these outer planets, the outer limits of our solar system in earth signs, transitioning into air signs, which again has this much more 
limitless and expansive quality. And at the same time, Saturn will move into Pisces, the sign which is associated with the dissolution of boundaries and limits. And so I really feel like right now, everything that happens is this preparation for this major shift, this, this completely new understanding of limits and limitlessness and what we're capable of um, globally that's coming in 2023. And the rest of this year and next year are very much kind of this gestation and preparation phase for that. Um, I think at the end of this year, we really have a strong emphasis on opening our minds. Um, and so right now the north node of the moon, which is this um, kind of evolutionary growth point, kind of our current dharma, um, is in Gemini. And the south node, um, so kind of our karmic patterns, karmic past, this point of release is in Sagittarius. And with the north node in Gemini, there's this really strong emphasis on emptying our minds, kind of the, the empty cup mindset in, in um, Taoism or Zen Buddhism. And it's not that we're, we're supposed to walk around kind of in this space of complete mindlessness, but it's more that we're releasing all of the old beliefs, all of the old thoughts, all of the old truths that keep us stuck in our current limits, um, in our current way of thinking about things. Um, that would be, you know, Sagittarius has these old truths, these old dogmas, these old beliefs that again can kind of constrain and confine us to a certain way of life. Um, Whereas Gemini is inviting in, you know, curiosity, duality, asking us to open our minds to something drastically new and different. Um, Gemini also asks us to get closer. So if we find ourselves kind of in polarizing situations um, or in situations where we have really strong emotional attachment to our beliefs, attachment to old stories, um, Gemini asks us to ask questions, to listen, to hold space and in so doing kind of frees us from our attachment to our old beliefs, our emotional attachment to those things. So again, we can expand our horizon, experience more of this limitlessness. Um, and so that's a big energy we're working with through the end of this year. Um, we'll have some eclipses coming up. And, um, you know, one of the eclipses is actually going to be um, on... What is it? On November 19th, we're actually going to have a lunar eclipse in Taurus, which is ushering in the next north node, um, which will be in Taurus starting in January of 2022. Um, and so we're going to be kind of working with this transition, opening our minds in preparation for kind of the next step. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but, but that's some of kind of the big energy of the rest of this year um, is very much, you know, how can we open our minds? How can we release the old truths, the old beliefs that can Find us, constrain us, keep us polarized, keep us separate, um, and prevent us from moving forward in, um, you know, this exciting, limitless, beautiful, um, diverse new way. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. I'm I'm taking notes of, of what <laughs> you mentioned, and I'm thinking about the north and south nodes. It's been like, a, like for me, it's been very, the, the time that, that this is, uh, North Node went through Leo and Cancer, mm -hmm. uh, which is my son and Ascendant, it really, um, a lot of shifts happened then. So I love mm -hmm. eclipses. It's like really shifting something in us as individuals mm -hmm. and, and in the whole collective and I'm really also looking forward to see how it will be when in a couple of years when the yeah the north node will go into now Taurus like you said and then yeah. and and then into Aries and then into Pisces I'm born mm -hmm. with that I think that's gonna be uh -huh. very interesting yeah 
the sh it's, it's really true. shifting the collective in a way like we're coming into that because yeah it feels like we're moving into that yeah. focus into the collective in that way isn't it yeah i i think so um you know another big thing that's happening this year and by the way i i don't know if i knew that somehow from you sharing your birthday but i would have guessed you were a pisces north node that just really mm. aligns in a, a beautiful way um but yeah, another kind of big energy we're working with right now, speaking of kind of this, this greater emphasis on the collective, is holding space for and listening to um, the rage, the pain, the wounds that, that people have experienced from oppression, um, often from these truths. Um, again, that would be you know, shadow, Sagittarius, that have kept some people kind of marginalized. Um, and so some of the, the big aspects we've had this year in 2021 have been this square between Pluto and Eris. And Eris is this dark goddess who's associated with um, discord and strife, but I think that we're starting to understand her in a new way where what she really offers is, you know, the truth. She is willing to, to look at the things that others don't want to talk about. She's willing to point out that, you know, even if we think that we're equal, even if we think that we're kind of pushing the envelope, we're still leaving certain groups out, certain people out. Um, we're still not addressing the full picture. We're still staying in this zone of comfort that suits some people, but not all people. And so what she really does is kind of say like, hey, you know what? I know that everybody is willing to agree that the emperor is wearing clothing, but he's actually completely naked, um, if you know that story. Um, and, and really kind of point out these truths that do kind of shake up and disrupt the status quo. Um, and so we've experienced a lot of that kind of groups of people who have been oppressed, who have been marginalized, who are saying, actually, you know what? These systems, Pluto and Capricorn, um, that have been around for a long time, these systems of oppression and control, they actually need to change and evolve if everybody is going to be counted, if everybody is going to be included. Um, and there's been a lot of pain in that. There's been a lot of rage there's been um you know any dark goddess or any dark anything um in astrology is usually something that's been oppressed or repressed and now needs space in the light in order to be kind of healed and move into its light form um and so with eris there's this need and um, again the north node in gemini it's really good for listening for asking questions for holding space there's this need to hold space for those things so that once more everybody can be invited to the table everybody can be included in the global community that we're kind of moving toward um, and another kind of dark goddess that we've been working with is Lilith um, I know you did a really great podcast recently on that one um, but she's been moving kind of back and forth and um, oscillating her true Lilith has been moving over the north node quite a bit this year um, and Lilith is also kind Kind of associated with um you know some some feminine rage she um is kind of vilified and demonized in mythology and um you know there's there's a need to kind of process and release that so that once again there is this ability to come into greater equality equality is a big lilith word um and and so yeah i think across the board right now um there's some tension, some pain, some anger, some, some big things that are being um, brought up to the surface that need to kind of be healed and heard and held space for in, in order to be released. Um, and so that's that's very much the energy right now. We have one more Pluto-Eris square, um, and that one is on October 8th. 
and um, the two planets will be kind of sitting in square aspect to each other for 2022 as well, but they won't be exact, um, not like this year. So we're going to be working with that energy, continuing that integration, um, as Shireen said, but but the, the major kind of um, moments with these two are, are going to be passed by 2022. Um, and similarly, um, Lilith will still kind of play a part next year, but she won't be sitting on the North Node in the way she has this year. So we'll still be working with her energy, but, um, but things are going to start to kind of settle and, and diffuse there a little bit. Um, we're learning the lessons now and hopefully we'll carry them with us. Mm, wow. There's so much in what, you, what you're saying that is, is so like what what we're experiencing like individually and uh, collectively definitely because i think that this when we it's like almost like this slowing down has made mm -hmm. us like really think and to mm -hmm. like stop and like see everything clearly it feels like almost like things are more clear now and maybe that's also the north Node, like facts everything that like we have been able to process information correctly and in in this detailed way and it's really like for me when we're speaking about the the goddesses first of all i'm feeling the energy of them because they've been processing within us within our bodies within our cycles within our rooms and it's really for, like from a health perspective what i've seen through chinese medicine um, i can see the manifestations in our physical health uh, and uh, it is really interesting uh, aries is is a very interesting one and Lilith and I think it's strange that up until now we like the main planets have all been the masculine energy this besides like okay maybe Jupiter is a little bit like mixed but I'm thinking about it's only Venus in the mm -hmm. like traditional and so that is also reflecting the world so when we do bring in the feminine aspects in astrology it's also our consciousness expanding into what we need to evolve into and i think that it would be interesting to hear um, your perspective on maybe we can talk about lilith and aries as uh, aries as well because i think that's important uh, mm -hmm. aspects of of the astrology yeah. Um, and you know, what you were saying about the planets being predominantly named after male deities, um, it's true. It's, it's really interesting that the moon kind of takes on a feminine quality. Um, so the moon is kind of the mother and then Venus is the lover. And those are the two roles that the female or the feminine gets to play in um, kind of traditional astrology. But you're right, as you know, new planets have been named, a lot have, of them have been named after goddesses um, or feminine kind of archetypes, even if they weren't goddesses, mythological figures. Um, and you know, with Eris and Lilith, I think personally, so my North Node is in Aries, so um, I'm always learning more about fire and embracing fire. And I think feminine fire has been especially kind of repressed. Um, I think when um, females or women or just kind of people who embody the feminine have tried to step into a place of you know, inspiration of leadership, of individuation, of passion, um, of fire. There's been kind of this, this fear and this resistance to it. And um, I don't know exactly why that is, but I've noticed that a lot of the goddesses that tend to represent fire um, have been kind of demonized or vilified um, over the years. And so, 
you know, we have um, Lilith and Eris, both of these goddesses, I would definitely identify with the fire element. I think that there's other qualities there, but Eris as a warrior goddess, as the sister of Mars, a fire planet, um, definitely takes on a bit of this fiery quality. And um, Lilith, I would argue, could definitely be um, strongly associated with Scorpio. Um, and Scorpio is traditionally ruled by Mars. So there's kind of this fiery quality to Scorpio, even though it's a water sign. Um, and then, you know, I, I could also see her having kind of an Aries quality to her and that she's very focused on her own individuation, her own path, um, her own truth, her gut instincts and so on. Um, and there have been lots of other goddesses from other cultures who were associated with fire, who ended up being kind of turned into, um, you know, the devil or a demon um, as new, you know, religions or, or mythologies took over. Um, and so I think that, that there's something about fire, about that quality of being able to stand up, to fight for oneself, to be independent, to um, be passionate, and um, to really go after what one wants that has been oppressed and repressed, and um, that fire has been kind of put out time after time, every time it gets reignited. And so that's where the wound comes from. Then we end up with, um, you know, kind of shadow Eris or shadow Lilith, where we, um, you know, we may get competition that, that feels a little bit unhealthy with shadow Eris, where we're, we're going after the same things as other people, um, feeling jealous or envious, instead of really just letting ourselves kind of step into our truth, into our fire and go with it. Um, we can also find with shadow Eris, um, you know, the desire to just kind of create fights or create discord um, without really having kind of a backing behind it. Um, just this, this desire to see other people's peace kind of disrupted. And so we really have to question ourselves when working with Eris because again, we haven't integrated her. We haven't fully owned her and reclaimed her energy. Um, but once we do, she is like, super powerful and can really help us come into um, come into our truth in a way where we're, we're not afraid of standing alone and um, you know being our own people and going after what we want. I feel like Eris is going to eventually kind of have um, more of a Kali quality, Kali from um, Hindu mythology, where she's no longer just seen as this bloodthirsty goddess who's roaming the battlefields um, and, and wanting to start more and more wars and fights, but rather is recognized for her ability to start the necessary fights and battles in order to kind of destroy um, old consciousness, old ways of being that no longer serves us, um, offering, you know, consciousness shifts, offering this, her own form of transcendence. Um, and Kali has a lot more of that kind of reverence in, in Hindu mythology. Um, she is seen as being this, this goddess who brings us to higher states who can help us achieve enlightenment by destroying, you know, the, the things that are old and outworn, the demons um, of our minds, of our souls that are no longer serving us. And so I, I do think Eris is actually going to take on more of that quality in time. Um, does that answer your question or was it a question or more kind of free flowing? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Yeah. It, it really is so interesting and I love that uh, the, this, these aspects are coming up now and becoming stronger and more interesting yeah. as well because yeah it's been if you read like the old mythologies from thousands of years back it's a lot and then after a while it started to shift and, and the focus started shifting so it is the underlying issue that we have become polarized in that way and not mm -hmm. balanced. So I think that's amazing. And do you see anything 
else that is important for because you said it's going to be quite intense in november which i feel like every year in october november something is <laughs> happening like it's very yeah. intense like on all levels it's like that time and it's it's really going into the darkness so i'm mm -hmm. we like have to prepare for that but do you think also is there any like specific signs or like during this year are there any groups that will be more affected astrologically um like more intense transformations yeah um so i'm going to answer a few of those questions kind of um starting with what's happening in november and going forward and november was actually in my opinion kind of almost the start of what's happening next year um so with this lunar eclipse that will have this partial lunar eclipse in taurus um it's going to be conjunct or sitting with the north node um but the north node will still be in gemini so the um full moon will be at the end of Taurus and the north node will be at the start of Gemini and they're going to be sitting in conjunction and in between those two is the goddess or the planet Sedna so again Sedna is the current kind of outer limit of our solar system right now or the furthest out planet that we know of and um, there's so much happening there but basically I feel like this is a very big transition, a very big shift because Sedna is again associated with the desire to cling to and hold on to old things that no longer serve us. Um, with Sedna sitting with the North Node in Gemini, we're asked to, to kind of take this final stab at releasing all of the old stories that are keeping us in the past, that are, are keeping us clinging to a life, um, you know, a way of existing that no longer serves us. And then we're bringing in Taurus and Taurus has strong associations with the goddess, um, especially kind of earth goddesses, but in general, she has this very, feminine goddess oriented quality to her and um and by her i mean the sign taurus i'm giving her a gender <laughs> um but taurus is also ruled by the planet venus so um that one planet that's named after a goddess um and so i think that you know there's this major shift that's starting in November um, and and part of that is going to be again this final process of releasing the old stories that we've been clinging to I'd say especially stories around the feminine um, old stories that are keeping us trapped in old ways of thinking about the feminine what it means to be feminine um, because there's so many limits and constraints around that right now and it affects men and it affects women and it's not helping anyone um, and then interestingly um, you know shortly after or at the very end of the year um, on the 19th of December Venus so um, the soon to be ruling planet of the north node is going to station retrograde um, so we have two kind of major, you know, personal planet retrogrades. One is Mercury retrograde that's coming up soon, which again, just kind of continues this theme of releasing old stories that keep us trapped in the past. It's in Libra, um, which is also ruled by Venus. So we have this quality of like restoring Venus, restoring our experience of the feminine, of um, what it is to be a lover, what it is to be, um, you know, grounded in our values. Um, Venus has this kind of alchemical quality to her. If we go back to Astarte and Inanna and Ishtar and, you know, all of the kind of deities that preceded Venus, um, there was so much more to her before. And so I think that there's this, this opportunity to kind of, um, you know, mythology evol evolves over time and 
these deities kind of took on different forms, but we can also evolve it back. We can, we can dip into like the ancient past and pull out the qualities that um, are necessary to make an archetype whole, um, in this case, to make kind of the feminine whole again. Um, and we can also bring in new qualities. We can integrate new things over time. We don't have to stick to the old myths. We don't have to stick to, you know, the, the old stories of what Venus represented. We can give her a new story. And I think that that's a big emphasis this year. Um, and some of it will require descents into, you know, our own limitations around Venus, especially when Venus goes retrograde in Capricorn conjunct Pluto, um, which will be the ruling planet of the South Node next year. Like we're talking major, you know, deep dives into the, all of the repressive and oppressive qualities that we personally have internalized around Venus, around the feminine. Um, you know, it's not just men who are perpetuating those um, kind of um, oppressive and, and repressive tendencies there. Women are too, like we're holding on to these stories, these beliefs, and we have the opportunity to release them, especially next year. I feel like next year is a huge one for freeing the feminine, for feminine empowerment, um, for restoring the feminine. All of that is, is really going to be, um, you know, a huge part of our journey next year. But um, it's all beginning this fall. And I think some of the, the harder work, um, some of that descent, as Shireen was kind of noting, um, and that integration and, and all of that work, that's going to be starting this fall. And the more work we can do this year, um, the more ready we'll be to really step into um, yeah, some major changes, some major shifts when um, the energies do shift um, in the new year. So, so it's going to be a powerful end of the year for sure. Um, and we're not going to be quite ready to move forward this year. It is going to be this time of going within and, and doing a lot of work. But again, it's, it's laying the groundwork, laying the foundation for some pretty cool stuff. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's beautiful. I love everything that you shared. And, and just knowing that we can like, have patience and and to take it like day by day and week by week and not forcing any changes because yeah we need to integrate the lessons and then that is the transformation process so I think that's going to be very interesting I'm really looking forward to seeing how these upcoming months and year unfolds and I would love for you to also share what you if people want to connect with you, what, what type of readings you have and coaching? Definitely. Um, and one thing I want to note really quickly um, for next year is that, you know, the North Node in Taurus is a very grounded placement. Um, it's really a call to kind of come back to ourselves, come back to our values, come back to our sense of kind of inner peace and inner stability and, and reassess what stability means to us. Um, not relying on outside sources of stability, which would be very much kind of Pluto and Capricorn, the South node ruler for next year. Um, and so, as we're starting to navigate these things at the end of this year, going into next year, the more we can focus on that inner peace, um, that inner sense of stability, kind of the better off we'll be. Um, for the second half of next year, the North Node will be conjunct Uranus, pretty much just constantly. And Uranus is this planet of change and evolution and awakening and enlightenment. Um, and again, this planet that helps us break free from old limits in order to really expand into something new and different. Um, and so that could have kind of a destabilizing quality to it. It's very exciting. Um, but again, just coming back to our bodies, coming back to um, 
yeah, that that inner peace, that inner stability, having those, you know, meditative practices, those practices that tap us back into who we are will be really key. Um, and so I just wanted to, to share that in advance because we may start to feel that pull and that need this year as well. Um, but it is it is going to be a really big one. So um, exciting things to come. And then um, personally, you know, you can keep in touch with me. Um, I have an Instagram account, it's North Node Coach. And then my website is the same, northnodecoach.com. Um, I do, I'm offering some end of year, um, or actually rather 2022 astrology readings right now through the end of the year. So if you're interested in kind of getting a feel for what 22 looks like for you personally, um, you can, you know, either check me out on Instagram or on my website and um, just look at that special offer. And then right now I'm actually starting this um, wild woman initiation with two other friends, um, Megan Hart, who who's a psychic medium, and Jessica Golden, who is an acupuncturist and herbalist and embodiment coach and relationship guru, among other things. And, um, you know, I think community is also a big theme right now and, and will be in the years to come as we're working more with you know, the feminine and kind of restoring the feminine. And so, um, so we're trying to, to build a community that helps people um, really tap into their intuition, into their instincts, reconnect with their truth um, and trust themselves more. Um, and so, so that's, that's something we're building out right now as well, which you can check out again on my website or on my Instagram. Um, and yeah, I do a range of other readings too, but um, but right now, I think since the theme is kind of 2022, um, definitely check out that reading if you're curious about how to navigate the energies of the year ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's everything sounds so beautiful, all of your work and everything you share on Instagram. So I can highly recommend for everyone <laughs> to check that out and I want to thank you so much for taking your time to share your wisdom and insights oh, into the you. upcoming year. And yeah, thank you so much for being here again. Thank you so much for having me, Shireen. This was really fun. Um, I really enjoy your podcast and I love your Instagram account and just all of the positivity and the healing and the inspiration that you're bringing to the world. So I feel really grateful to get to be part of it and honored. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>